be in the house of the Lord, and I hope that you're having a good uh, Sunday today. Uh, if you're visiting with us here today, we are so glad that you chose to uh, visit with us. If uh, you happen to have missed any of the messages uh, in this series, you can always go on our website at uh, stoneridgecc.com and you can watch uh, those messages. I'd like to welcome those of you who are watching and listening uh, live right now. Well, uh, after the holidays, we'll be starting a new uh, series entitled God's Church. God's Church. Whose church is it? It's His church, and we'll be uh, in the book of First uh, Corinthians, and so look forward to uh, starting that series after the holidays. Uh, today, we're wrapping up our series, uh, Family Issues, Family Issues, and we all have issues in our family in one way or another, and so I hope that this series has been a blessing and an encouragement and a help uh, to you. Uh, well, where did we uh, leave off last week? Where did we leave off last week? Uh, we left off with uh, Jacob uh, leaving the land of his father-in-law uh, to return to his homeland, the promised land. <laughs> And uh, what, what happened uh, when Jacob left? What happened to him? Did he make peace before he left with his father-in-law? Remember, there was some conflict there. Was he able to make peace with his father-in-law, Uncle Laban? Uh, yes, he was. How do we know this? Well, because they set up a pile of stones uh, to stand as a witness to their covenant, this this pact of peace that they made uh, before he left to go and make peace with his brother Esau. So let's jump right back into Scripture where we uh, last left off here in Genesis chapter 31, uh, verses 48 through 50. Uh, then Laban declared, uh, this pile of stones will stand as a witness to remind us of the covenant we have made uh, today. This explains why it was called Gilead, witness pile, but it was also called mitzvah, which means watchtower, for Laban said, may the Lord keep watch between us to make sure that we keep this covenant and we, when we are out of each other's sight. If you mistreat my daughters or if you marry other wives, God will see it even if no one else does. That's a key phrase right there. God will see it even if no one else does. He is a witness to this covenant uh, between us. So what is it that stands out to me in these verses? What phrase stands out to me? And it, it's simply, God will see it if no one else does. Well, who am I? I am not who I claim to be. I claim to be a Christian. However, the truth is, I don't always act like one. Some of you know that, and yet you still love me. Others of you don't because you're just not around me enough. Either way, I don't like who I am. Whether you see these inconsistencies slash sins in my life or not, I see them. More importantly, God sees them. I cannot hide anything from Him, uh, nor do I want to. I, I want to come clean with Him. Why? Well, Solomon says in Proverbs 28, 13, people who conceal their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. People who try to hide or conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and they, they turn, they go in the opposite direction, they will receive mercy and grace and compassion. So my question simply is this, what is it you're trying to hide today? <laughs> what is it that you're trying to hide today? What is it that you don't want anyone to know about? Uh, there are some people who know about the sin in your life, whether you re realize it or not. There are some people who know. There are others who you have fooled. 
Either way, do you like who you are? Either way, do, do you like who you are? Whether others see these inconsistencies slash sins in your life or not, God sees them. You cannot hide anything from him. Well, what does he want from you? He wants you to come clean. <laughs> he wants you to come clean. What happens when you come clean? You can once again have peace. Right? When you come clean, you can once again have peace. A peace with the Lord and peace with your family. Who is it you need to make peace with today? Who is it that you need to make peace with today? Is it a mother-in-law? Or in Jacob's case here, is it a father-in-law? Is it a mom or a dad that you need to make peace with? Is it a brother or a sister? Is it a friend at school? Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe it's a coworker that you two have just been butting heads. Who is it that you need to make peace with today? For Jacob, it was not only his father-in-law, Uncle Laban. We all have those uncles, right? Those uh, crazy uncles. Thinking of National Lampoon's Christmas vacation. Sorry. I don't know where my head's at this morning. He not only needed to make peace with Uncle Laban, but he needed to make peace with his brother Esau. So what did he do? He started on this journey to go back and make peace with his brother. What happened to him as he started on his way again? He met some angels of God as he was about to enter the promised land. Why did God send these angels as he a step foot into the promised land. Why did God send them? To let Jacob know that he would be protecting him. To let Jacob know that he would be with him. Let's jump right back here into our story, Genesis 32, 1 and 2. As Jacob started on his way again, angels of God came to meet him. Uh, when Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is God's camp. God is here. So he named uh, the place uh, Mahamamon. What is it I want you to know? When you go to make peace with the one you're at odds with, God will protect you. Let me say that again. When you go to make peace with, with the one that you're at odds with or in conflict or there's tension with, God will protect you. He will send his angels with you to comfort you. Did Jacob believe God's protection and comfort would be enough, right? God said, hey, I'm, I'm sending you these angels, Jacob. I want you to know I'm behind you. I'm with you. Did Jacob believe that God's protection and comfort would be enough? No. <laughs> How do we know this? Because it wasn't long after he left that we find out he was terrified, Right? God sends the angels and he is still shaken in his boots, so to speak. Let's jump right back in, verse 3. Uh, chapter 32, verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau, who was living in the region of Seir in the land of Edom. He told them, give this message to my master Esau. Humble greetings from your servant Jacob. Until now I have been living with Uncle Laban. Now I own cattle, donkeys, flocks of sheep and goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have sent these messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me, right? Remember, there's this rift, there's this tension. Last we saw at the beginning of this journey, his brother Esau wanted to kill him. So after delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, we met your brother, Esau, and he is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. <laughs> uh, 
Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with the flocks and herds and cattle into two groups. He thought if Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. What is it you're afraid of today? What is it that you're afraid of today that that you're thinking, what if this happens in my life or in my family? Is is it what someone's going to do to you, right, at work, right? You you don't have to be afraid of them. Why? Because God is on your side. Uh, He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. So what is it you need to do? Cry out to him in prayer. Cry out to him in prayer. Did Jacob cry out to the Lord in prayer? He did. He did. What exactly did he pray? That God would remember his promise to always treat him kindly. His brother's coming with an army of 400 men. And so Jacob beseeches, Jacob ask, Jacob requests that, hey, you said you would take care of me, you would always treat me kindly, I need you, Lord. (laughs) Let's continue on, verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you told me, return to your own land and your relatives. You, You told me to come back home, and you promised me I will treat you kindly. I'll take care of you. I'm not worthy of all the unfailing and love and faithfulness you have shown to me, your servant. I'm not worthy, Lord. (laughs) When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. Oh, Lord, please rescue me from the uh, hand or, or from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid that he is coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promise me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. Well, Jacob prays to the Lord. But did he believe that would be enough? Did he believe this prayer? When he prayed to the Lord, did did he believe that would be enough? No, he didn't. How do we know this? Because he also sent gifts to his brother Esau. So he's trying everything in the book to make things right with his brother And he's scared about what's going to happen, how this is all going to unfold and turn out. And maybe you're in a similar situation. I don't know if I can talk to this person because I'm just afraid things are going to go south. Things are going to unravel. So he says, I've prayed, but I'm going to also send some gifts to my brother Esau. Why does he do this? Why, Why does he send gifts to his brother? To try to appease him. Let's continue on, verse 20. Jacob thought, I will try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. So the gifts were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent that night in the camp. What happened that night Jacob was in the camp? What happened when he was there in the camp? Well, if you know the story, and most of you do, He sent his family on ahead. He sent his family on ahead. Why is this significant? Why is that significant? Because he was left all alone in the camp. What do we find out when we're left all alone to wrestle with God in in our thoughts, in our feelings? What do we find out when, when we're all alone by ourselves with the Lord? We find out who we really are. We find out who we really are. Continuing on in verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip 
and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Penel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. What was God doing here? This is an an unusual uh, exchange, right? Here here he's wrestling with Jacob. What, What exactly was God doing when he was wrestling here with Jacob? He was breaking Jacob down. He was breaking him down. Why was he breaking him down, right? When you wrestle, you break someone down on the mat. Your goal is to pin them, to get them to submit. So what was God doing here? He was breaking them down. Why? To teach Jacob that if he was going to win in life, he had to be dependent upon the Lord. The same is true for you and me. If we're going to win in life, we have to be dependent upon the Lord. We have to submit ourselves to Him. We cannot win the battles that we're facing, and I don't know what battle it is that you're facing in your life today, but you cannot win it without the Lord. In the past, Jacob won his battles with his brother. Why? because he resorted to deception. This time was different. There was no deceiving his brother. His brother was coming with an army of 400 men. What is it then Jacob needed to do? Trust the Lord. Did he? Yes. How do we know this? Because the Lord changed his name from Jacob deceiver to Israel. God fights. Jacob had always been too proud and self-sufficient to let God fight for him. Sound like anyone you know? (laughs) I don't know about you, but I can be very proud and self-sufficient Jacob had always been too proud and self-sufficient to let God fight for him. However, now he has no choice but to let God fight for him. 400 men are coming for him. (laughs) He had no choice but to let God fight for him. Why? Because God also took away this wrestler's greatest strength, his hip tendon, right? Right? It's all in the hips, right? And so God touches his hip and he takes away this wrestler's greatest strength. So he has nowhere else to go, nowhere else to turn but to God. And sometimes that's where we need to get, where we're down on the mat, flat on our back, before we cry out and say, yes, Lord, I need you. I cannot do this without you. (laughs) Verse 31, Genesis 32, verse 31. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. (laughs) He's now got a battle scar from this wrestling match with the Lord. Perhaps some of you have some battle scars today from some fights. Why do you continue to struggle with this thing or person in your life? Why is it that you continue to struggle with this thing or person in your life? Could it be because you're not relying on the Lord, instead you're relying on your own strength? Could it be that's why you're struggling with this thing or person in your life? 
It's because you're relying on your own strength and instead of on Jesus, on the Lord. You cannot defeat or overcome this thing without the help of the Lord. Let me say that again. You cannot defeat or overcome this thing in your life without the help of Jesus, without the help of the Lord. You have to put your trust in Him. What will happen when you do this, when you put your trust in Jesus? You will see the face of God. Well, how do I know this? Because when Jacob put his trust in the Lord, he saw the face of God clearer than he had ever seen it before. Continuing on, Genesis 33, verses 1 through 10. Then Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and his two servant wives. He put the servant wives and their children at the front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and her and Joseph last. And then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they both wept. Hmm. Then Esau looked at the women and children and asked, who are these people with you? <laughs> these are the children God has graciously given to me, your servant, Jacob replied. Then the servant wives came forward with their children and bowed before him. Next, Leah with her children, and they bowed before him. Finally, Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed before him. And what were all the flocks and herds I met as I came? Esau asked, what's what's all this stuff? Jacob replied, they are a gift to ensure your friendship. My brother, I have plenty, Esau answered. Keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob insisted, no, if I have found favor with you, please accept this gift from me. And what a relief it is to see your friendly smile. (laughs) It's like seeing the face of God, right? Seeing you today and getting things right with you, huh, it's, it's like seeing the face of God. It's so refreshing. Was it necessary for Jacob to send these gifts to his brother? Was it necessary for him to do this? No. However, it was the wise thing to do. It was wise of him to do this. Why? Because it showed that he wanted to make things right with his brother. He wanted to make things right. He he wanted to make his brother whole again. Therefore, he owned up to what he did that led to the fallout between them, right? He owned up to what he did that led to the fallout between them. Here's a key question and point. What is it we have to do if we want to live at peace with everyone? What is it that we have to do if we want to live at peace with everyone? And isn't that what we want? We want to live at peace with people in our family, with people in the community, people at our workplace. We have to own up to what we did that led to the fallout. We have to own up to what we did, our part. Some self-reflection. Well, what did I do that led to this fallout? I must admit, I'm just like Jacob. <laughs> I, I often wrestle with God when it comes to doing the right thing. Right? <laughs> God says, here's what I want you to do. And I'm like, I I don't want to do that. (laughs) You ever wrestle with God when it comes to doing the right thing? You feel that tug of war in your heart? I know I should talk to this person, but I don't want to, right? I know I should make things right with them, but it's not easy. I'm already thinking about the relationships in my family that bring and cause tension. Driving back to Tennessee tomorrow, 
10 hour drive. It's nice to go from zero to 50. Not the speed limit, but the weather. <laughs> Something about when it's zero here and it's 50 there, feels nice. That being said, I'm thinking about family. Who I'm going to see, what I'm going to say when I see them, how I'm going to act. And I'm wrestling with, am I going to do the right thing? <laughs> I, I, I would rather resort to deception to get what I want. Like Jacob, right? I would rather be conniving and deceiving to get what I want. Because that's what my flesh does. However, that's not what God wants me to do. He wants me to come clean and be honest. I believe the same is true for you. So what is it you need to come clean with and be honest about today? It's our closing question, right? It's for you to think about. What is it that you need to come clean with today and you just need to be honest about it? Here's the real reason. Here's what's really going on and what's really happening. And pour out your heart to the Lord. Talk to Him. And then go and make things right with whoever it is that you need to make things right with. Who is it you need to make peace with today? Is it a mother-in-law, a father-in-law? <laughs> Mom or dad, a brother or sister? Is it a friend or neighbor, a boss or coworker? I don't know who it is, but you know who it is. Right? It's whoever it is the Lord is speaking to your heart about right now. Is this easy? No. <laughs> it's a wrestling match. It's an internal wrestling match. Will you submit it to God and say, here I am. <laughs> I have nowhere else to turn but to you. Because if you do, <laughs> God has promised to send his angels when you go to make peace with the ones you're at odds with, to protect you and to comfort you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Ed, I, I haven't made peace with the Lord. I haven't made peace with Him. I, I've been holding back my heart. I haven't given Him my heart in my life. I came here today with, with the hand out and the wall up. And I don't have peace in my heart and in my life. And you need to invite the Prince of Peace into your heart. You need to make peace with Him. Maybe you're here today and you say, Ed, well, I am a Christian, but I don't have peace right now in my life. There are some relationships and some tensions and I, I, I want to make things right. I want to do what is right in his eyes. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. It's powerful and it's convicting. And sometimes it just steps all over our toes. And sometimes, <laughs> to my own shame, I must admit that I don't want to hear it. <laughs> because... I'm like, oh, I got to wrestle with this. But we need to hear it, Lord Jesus. We need to come clean and be honest, first and foremost, with you. Because people who conceal, people who try to hide whatever it is they're doing or whatever it is they're involved in, will not prosper. But if we confess and we turn from that and stop it and go in the opposite direction, we will find mercy and grace and love and compassion. And maybe you're here today and you say, Ed, I've been going in the wrong direction. <laughs> and because of that, peace is what's missing in my family. Peace is what's missing in my life. And I need Jesus. If that's you, then I'd like to lead you in a prayer, a prayer that you pray softly and quietly in your heart 
as you repeat these words after me. And here they are. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and change me and make me like you. If you just prayed that prayer, God will honor that prayer. Maybe you're here this morning. You say, Ed, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been living like one. I am not who I claim to be. (laughs) And I can feel that. And I want to come clean and be honest about what's going on with you today. I want, I want to, you already know what's going on with me, Lord. Oh, Lord, I pray for myself and I pray for my brothers and sisters that we would come clean and be honest with what's really going on, that we may confess it to you and turn from it, that we may once again have peace, and that you give us the strength and the courage to talk to whoever it is that we need to talk to, a mother-in-law, a father-in-law, a brother, a sister. Help us to do what is right in your, in your eyes, Lord Jesus, and may your will be done. In your name we pray. 